Okay, let's get started. So we're shifting from heads inside the gray box to talk about probabilistic views of the systems. Um, you might imagine this is uh, the more uh, the perspective of an observer who comes to a new system and uh, just has data and it looks kind of noisy and probabilistic. So the first blush is that that would be the set of tools you would first appeal to. Notions from probability, probability theory, measures of randomness, and so on. So what we're going to do is uh, uh, three lectures nominally on trying to understand how to deal with stochasticity. The first will be a little bit, uh, today, will be a little bit looking back at dynamical systems and trying to understand how dynamical systems evolve probability distributions. In a sense, today, it's, I'll introduce some new terminology and things like that because we have a new set of ideas from probability theory. But the basic idea is very close to what we've already seen in dot spreading. Right? You could think of that initial cluster of 100,000 points on the Lorenz as some kind of pointillistic summary of a very tight probability distribution. We saw the net effect was to take that and stretch it out and spread out the states. So we'll formalize that today and then look at some simpler systems, namely one-dimensional maps and how they interact with probability distributions. But the idea is not really so different from that. Point. So that's fine. So we'll look at how dynamical systems uh, operate on probability distributions and introduce the key ideas from, well, a few key ideas from probability theory that are appropriate for understanding that. But we're also interested in trajectories, orbits over time, and eventually measurement sequences. So not so much today, we'll be looking at the state space and distribution over states. We're interested in the appearance of stochasticity and randomness over time. I mean, up to this point, we've been talking about chaotic systems having really complicated orbit sets. So there's a corresponding set of questions looking at the, uh, uh, these complicated behaviors as a stochastic process that unfolds over time. And then sort of the final step in this is to acknowledge um, the fact that our view of the world, the way we interact with it, is always through some, is mediated through some sensory apparatus or through some instrument in an in experiment. So we'll introduce ideas of measurement theory. Why do that? Well, we again, kind of appealing to the dot spreading experiment, we could think of that initial type distribution as the limit of our experimental control of the initial state of the system. It was a finite resolution. And we saw the consequence of that. If I couldn't exactly control the state of the system, small variations beyond my control, beyond my measuring instrument's ability to distinguish, actually got manifest in the macroscopic scale. So, and then this will set us up to start talking about um, how to describe stochastic processes using information theory. And there'll be kind of another sort of punctuation point here, kind of step back and ramp up again, basic ideas and in information theory. Just like these three lectures, we're kind of resetting a little bit and starting with some new ideas in probability theory. OK, so just to emphasize, had our heads inside the gray box here. In a sense, we get to do that today, too. But soon, we're going to close the box. And the goal is to be down there where observers are building models. The actual model building won't happen until the spring quarter. But we're going to talk about instrumentation, notions of stochasticity, and then information theory. And we're going to pretty much exhaust what information theory has to say about the modeling process. And then we have to do something else, and that'll be spring. So we've been here, and we're pretty rapidly moving to here, namely looking at stochastic processes. Again, the reason we study dynamical systems, I wanted to give you a sense, a concrete sense of how systems can produce noisy-looking, random-looking behavior, even if they're deterministic. There are other sources of noise in the world, inaccurate uh, measuring instruments. Maybe our measuring instruments or sensory apparatus itself is noisy, it produces some noise. Maybe we don't have the right conception of the world. Right? We think the, the planets are moving in terms of epicycles. So we have this very complicated 
essentially periodic decomposition of emotions, but then suddenly you know, Mercury, Mercury goes into retrograde, and uh-oh, that's not regular periodic behavior. So we, the system appears more complicated in that view until we, we humans decide that maybe it's a better model to have the sun at the center and have the planets orbiting around. And suddenly we have these nice elliptic orbits that are easier to describe and also to predict other behavior. So, so there are many different levels in which this uncertainty, the world appears uncertain to us. Deterministic chaos is this one active mechanism, but there are also issues having to do with resolution and accuracy that an observer observes the world with, but also even sort of cognitive or conceptual bases that are wrong. In fact, in that case, you could say, is there, is there, will the data ever tell us how a system itself should be represented? So again, more advertisement for the spring. <laughs> We'll, be, we'll finally have enough tools that in spring we start to answer some of these bigger questions. Okay. So first few things are just definitional, just to kind of remind you of some of the ideas in probability theory. Um, this is not uh, in sufficient detail that if you don't know probability theory, you can sort of ramp up from it. But you can go look at pretty much any, oh, I'd say maybe... Uh, junior, senior, college level probability theory, stochastic process text in the first chapter or two. The classic reference in probability theory is Feller. And it's the two volume set, one of those you know, gold letter embossed, gray uh, bound volumes. Um, suggested readings are on the um, one of the pages on the class website for this. Um, we won't need a lot of detailed probability theory because we're going to adapt it to some particular uses. Okay, so just to get started here, um, two cases, discrete case and continuous case. So we're going to denote a discrete random variable, capital letters, typically x and y and z. Um, and then the idea is that as we look at the system, events occur, so-called events. And then those events are labeled out of some alphabet. So be k different events. Could be rainy, not rainy, could be sunny, not sunny, could be heads and tails. But there's some finite set of events. And we talk about the random variable having a quote, realization. I'm looking at the coin and I see that it's heads. And so the notation here is lowercase symbols mean a particular value. Right? So the realizations are one of these labels. Some you know, particular moment. You look at the system and it's tails. So that's the little case. Uh, now, okay, so that's just the, the variables we're looking at. We've chosen these observables. Now, how are we going to describe the probabilistic aspect? Well, in for discrete random variables, there's just sort of one object called probability mass function. Sometimes we'll use the word distribution. In the discrete case, that's not a confusion. And what we mean here is that when the random variable takes on a particular realization, there's a number associated with that called its probability, the likelihood that this thing occurred. And we'll just note that this way. I tend to be a little more verbose, and I actually think probability is a very sophisticated concept. So I give it some more uh, ink here. I say PR to mean probability. So the shorthand for the probability of heads or tails occurring would be probability X, like that. Or, and you'll see in some probability free texts, in some context, especially in more. Uh, Mathematical settings, sometimes you actually have to write out this more verbose notation. It's all random variable taking on this value. But shorthand is fine enough for us. Now, what are these numbers? Well, they're between 0 and 1 inclusive for every event. And when you sum them up, they're normalized. Okay, that's fine. What, is, what does normalization mean? It means that something will always occur. Even if one thing and only one thing occurs, it must occur with probability one. So that's the, what normalization means. Examples, well, okay, a biased coin, the, the event space is over heads, tails, this is the alphabet, HT. And then to specify it, we have to give the probability of the random variable capital X being heads, probably one thirds, being tails, probably the two thirds. So it's between zero and one, and they sum to one normalized distribution. Another kind of random variable would be would have this event space. This 
process emits sequences of blocks of three bits, three, three binary uh, variables. There are eight possible, so the event space here, there are eight binary strings of length three, and here's one particular example random variable where I assign uh, probability zero to three zeros, zero, zero, one, and one, zero, zero. Describe this random variable as no pairs of zeros, if you like, a mere description of that. And then one, zero, one, probably one third, and all the others have probably one sixth. So you have to go through here. These are probably zero, so I've got uh, five other events. That's got a third. These others have uh, these four other events, probably one sixth. Well, that's two thirds plus a third is one, so it's normalized. And so on. Okay, just a little definition, mostly introducing terminology and a couple examples. The other kind of random variable we'll look at are continuous random variables. Same notation here. Capital X is the random variable. Now our event space is continuous. Uh, think the real line. Uh, and we have two different ways of specifying the probability of events. In fact, when we have a continuous event space, it's a bit of an issue what an event is. If I say x takes on the value 1 over pi, that's a very specific event. In fact, it's so specific, it will, it, that particular thing will never occur under most distributions. So, so as a consequence of that issue, um, there are two ways to talk about probability over continuous random variables. One is the cumulative distribution function. And what that is, it's the probability that the random variable takes on a value up to some, some particular realization value, little x. Okay, I just know that p of x there. Uh, again, uh, these numbers here are between 0 and 1. So, so this function goes from 0 to 1. And we also say that, that if, if, if this function is continuous, so now you kind of imagine this is a function of x, and we're moving x along its, its domain and it's monotonically increasing. We're encompassing more and more of the event space, therefore, these uh, sets of events only get more likely. Then uh, we say the random variable is continuous. And I'll show you some examples of this. Uh, probably what's more uh, familiar and resonates more directly with the notion of probability for the discrete variable case is the probability density function. Crudely speaking, probably density function is like the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. So it's, it's a positive number. Um, and we're thinking now of the probability of a small infinitesimal range about the value x. So the way we think about this is actually define it this way. This is just a metaphorical description as a derivative, what we do is we, little p of x here, it's probability per unit interval. That's why it's called the density. And it's the difference between the cumulative distribution function. Probably that x is less than little x plus dx minus probability that the random variable is less than x. So there's some small little interval of change. Um, normalization has uh, two different uh, expressions here. One for the cumulative distribution function. Probably the x is less than infinity, basically the whole continuous event space. It's one. Something has to happen. Something happens. Or we can integrate this probability density function over the domain, over the, the, the values of the continuous random variable, and that integral should be one. So here I'm writing these down not in sort of the general case, but as if the, the realizations were in the, on the real line. Uh, a one useful notion, which also applies to discrete distributions, if I give you a random variable and its distribution, sometimes we're interested in the support of the random variable. And those are simply the events, the realization values, the events that have positive probability. OK, just, just definitions here. Um, examples, hopefully will help 
clarify this notion of uh, the di difference between density and distribution. Continuous random variable x, let's take uh, the realizations to be the real line, so just one dimensional random variable on the real line. Um, and then this one is just going to be uniform distribution on a unit interval. So that means that for the probability of density, which I find more intuitive, we have probability 1 when the random variable is between 0 and 1 and it's 0 otherwise. So you can imagine in your mind the plot is 0 everywhere except on 0 to 1. We have this function which has amplitude 1 between 0 and 1. Now the distribution function, again, this is the probability that the random variable takes values up to the value of x. So that's 0 for, for x negative, right? There has been no probability. It's actually a linear function on the interval, and then it tops out at 1 for values, for realizations with value larger than 1. Right, so that plot is goes like this. That plot is off. So you can see how this is like a derivative, right? So the distribution function had constant slope, this had constant value over the And then finally, the support of this random variable is just a unit interval, 0, 1 inclusive. Um, another familiar one, example of continuous random variable on the real line here would be the Gaussian distribution. Uh, the density is what we usually write down. That's what we work with. That's just this familiar exponential quadratic form with mean and standard deviation. Uh, now. The cumulative distribution function is this kind of complicated object. I want to know what the probability that x is uh, less than uh, this value x. I integrate that from minus infinity up to the value I'm interested in over the density, which integral one cannot do in closed form, but it happens so often that it's given a name. It's called the error function. And this kind of highlights a little bit why often it's more intuitive to work with densities. But there are some problems that come up with very complicated distributions and densities, which we're going to run into. Our dynamical system is going to generate really complicated looking densities, where sometimes the distribution, this integral form, is easier to work with. OK, familiar examples. Very often, we have sets of different events out there, different observables, and we have questions about how they're correlated. This could be measurements across time, or it could be two different variables, temperature and amount of sunlight. So we need to talk a little bit about uh, sets of random variables. So we're going to have uh, two big X and big Y, and they'll have the corresponding alphabets, script X and script Y. And they're going to be described by what's called the joint distribution. So we can think of now the notion of event are pairs of occurrences of x and y. And then we assign probabilities just like we did before. Okay. Um, we can recover, if we were just interested in the distribution over x, we can recover what's called the marginal distribution by summing out all those values that y can take on, particular values. This is a normalized distribution. It's a little bit of an exercise to show if I have a normalized joint distribution, the marginals are normalized. Pretty straightforward. Then we can also project down or marginalize down to y by summing out over all the realizations of random variable x. Well, that's fine. We just took the previous notions and generalized them to pairs. Now, slightly more interesting is to talk about how if we have this probability distribution over joint events x, y, how we can factor that function in different ways. So here, what you can do is uh, talk about what are called conditional distributions. I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, but stay tuned. It can get complicated in just a little bit. Uh, so we have the probability of x and y, and we can factor that into the product of the probability of x given that we know y times the probability of y. We also have another choice. Same joint distribution, probability of x and y, but now I can factor that into a conditional distribution, the probability of y given x times the probability of x. And this move, this choice that you can make, is used over and over and over again 
maybe most uh, famously, it's called Bayes' theorem. Um, you just have a choice here. Um, so pairing and contrasting the two different factorizations often leads to interesting results. So what, what are these funny things here? This conditional just probability of x given y, probability of y given x. Well, they're essentially defined as the ratio of the probability of the joint distribution over the marginal. The probability of x, y given x, the probability of the joint, or the probability of x. Obviously, you can only do this, it's only well defined when the x events occur, with some probability. So we have to be a little bit careful here. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, what's my uh, uncertainty in y given x if x never occurs? So there's a little bit of subtlety here. We'll work in examples where this is, issue is easy to take care of, but this definition highlights a little bit of what is going on behind the scenes and why you have to be a little bit careful. A very common question is, if I have two variables, x and y, is how are they related? And I would say, Almost all of the information theory we're going to develop is to help us be more explicit and quantitative about how variables relate to one another. And that in the, in the context of probability theory, we have this notion of statistical independence. So we say that x is independent of y, with this upside down t here. And what that means is that this joint factoring is just simply the product of the marginals. Right? So think back to the previous definition of conditional distribution. Our uncertainty in x and our uncertainty in y aren't conditional at all. The probability that the event x and y occurs is the product of the probability that x occurred alone and the probability that y occurred alone, just the product. So this is one way of testing. If I have some distribution over pairs of events, I can check numerically if this equality holds and then conclude that the two events, whatever they are, don't depend on each other, are independent. Slightly enriched version of this is called conditional independence. So now we're asking about is x independent of y given some other knowledge called that random variable z. So it's just a generalization of this. We say that x and y are independent given z if this joint conditional distribution factors into the product of the marginal uncertainty given z over x and marginal uncertainty y given z. So there's a whole calculus of once you introduce conditional and joint distributions of how you can take, imagine we had six random variables here. We had two things we were, knowledge we had, we had to understand given that knowledge, what the relationships were with the other six variables, the ways of factoring these things and testing independence. And we will do this again and again and again. Hidden behind this conditional independence is um, a lot of how we are going to talk about the structure of the behavior in random variables. We're going to try to find z's such that these other variables of inventing these things such that it makes the observ observations independent. And those will be, those z's that we find that do this will be particularly informative about how the system is structured. So this might seem a little innocuous, but it's the, kind of the key idea that is going to run through uh, most of the spring. So at this point, we're just introducing some notation. So this is kind of this little calculus of probabilities and factoring joint and conditional joint distributions. Okay. So that's really just introducing some notation from probability theory. But now let's talk about, take a look at how dynamical systems evolve distributions. So again, the way we'll think about it a little bit is the picture of the dot spreading experiments. So we have some dynamical system now with the state space. That's going to be our event space. And then some dynamic on that space. Okay. Uh, we'll have a state density. This is just the distribution over the state space the density function of the state space. Um, and what we've been doing so far, including that demonstration of dot spreading, was we were just choosing particular initial conditions and evolving them forward. 
talked about initial conditions and trajectories or orbits that were produced. Now we're going to ask uh, a similar question, except for a different kind of object, not points in the state space, but for distributions. So we're going to start with some initial density. So I'll make the subscript here be time. So time zero, we have this initial density. We specify, again, as I said for the dock spreading experiments, think of this as could be a tight little Gaussian distribution that was some model of our um, control or measurement accuracy of the experiment. It could also be other things, too. Um, so how do we evolve a density? We know how to evolve points. We just look at the dynamic and follow the arrows or apply the function to the discrete time mapping. But how do, how, how do we take the initial distribution and move it forward under the dynamic to produce the distribution at the next time or next instant? So that's the question. We saw that, so we understand it intuitively. But how are we going to describe that mathematically? Well, the main idea just relies on conservation of probability. So let me describe this to you graphically first, and then I'll go through the notation. The goal here is to generalize the dynamic that we have that takes states to states to a function that operates, a dynamic that operates on distributions. So, so the first step is we assume conservation of probability over time. So here I've got some, just think of this as if it were, let's say, a discrete time mapping. Um, this will be the sort of initial state and state the next time. And then I have some function called T of x here. And the question here is I have a little bit of probability mass. And that's situated between x and x plus dx. Uh, the yellow area here corresponds to the amount of that probability mass. Right, so I have the density function times the little dx. Density function is the height times dx. That gives me an area. That's, that's a probability number. That's the probability that I will find the system between x and x plus dx. And now I'm going to push it forward through t of x. And I'm, I'm assuming that probability is conserved. That means here is that the amount of yellow here is the same as yellow here. So now in this sort of cartoon picture, let me just say something about how you should be thinking about it. Imagine I'm down here and I have a like loop coordinate axis as x and probability of x down here. Think of that up here. In this direction I have probability of y and the y coordinate. But graphically, it's, what happens is this yellow amount comes up here and it's the same. That's the so we know how to take x and map it forward. So x goes to t of x, which is the variable y. x plus dx, but then in t of x, we get y plus dy. It's up here. And then, for example, if this distance, if this distance here shrunk because the slope was low, the distance between y and y plus dy would be small. And so that I had the same amount of uh, probability mass, the amplitude t of y would be larger. Also the converse, if the slope is very, very steep here, this interval, the support, is going to get spread out. And in order to have the same area, then the probability amplitudes in the next step would be less. Okay, so this is what I just said. By mapping forward a little bit of the probability density function, the next time step, I assume I have the same amount of probability in that little area. Right. Does, yeah. How does that deal with, say, the We'll get to that. Yes. Stay tuned. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Oh, well, I maybe I didn't say that here. Yeah. Here. This slide. Right. So again, probably density times a dx, that's a probability number. Think of it as an area. Same thing here. Density times a dy, that's a number. Those are equal. Yellow is equal. Okay. So that's the idea. So how are we going to describe this mathematically? We want, we want to think about some operator that takes the current distribution to the next distribution. So that's the first way to do this. It's called the perron frobenius operator. And so now we've got our locally, we have our function t of x. And what we want is the distribution in the range of t of x mapping from its domain. So what we're going to do here is um, basically just formalize what I said in terms of the slope. So the probability amplitude, so we're calculating this height here, okay, at the next time step, it's the previous height divided by 
absolute value of the slope. Okay, first, why absolute value? I don't really care whether it's a positive slope or a negative slope. What I'm interested in is how much that little dx got stretched out if the slope was greater than 1 or shrunk if the slope was less than 1. So we do that by putting the slope in the denominator. Right? So as the slope goes to 0, whatever probability mass I have here is getting concentrated in a smaller and smaller interval, which means all that mass gets piled into it and therefore I have very high probability. It probably concentrates when the slope goes to 0, then we're dividing by a very small number, which means this on the left-hand side gets large, and vice versa. If the slope is very steep, small variation here gets spread out for the whole thing, and then that will reduce. This will be a number greater than 1. Therefore, the probability amplitude the next time in, in the range of the function will be less. The amplitude will be less. Should sound a little bit like kind of stretching and shrinking we were talking about before. Now, this is just a local view. So just like we were saying, there might be other contributions. Imagine t of x dipped down over here. So the way we think about this, and this is kind of the main idea of evolving the probability distribution forward, the curious thing is the way we think about it is we look at the range of the function and we ask who contributed to me because we're mapping forward. So that's what this is. So I'm just taking this you know, heuristically described dependence on the absolute value of the slope, how that modifies probability amplitudes. And what we do is we just sum over all those values in the domain of the function, domain of t of x, that contribute to y. So this notation here means the set of x, the x is in the set that are the inverse images of y. So I'm sitting here and asking, oh, here's one contribution, maybe t of x is over here, have another contribution. Okay, so this is the Perone Forbini's operative way of thinking about it. The clever and more analytic way of doing this is called the Forbini's Perone equation. And this is the actual operator that I use. So let me uh, kind of explain the, the, the equation first, and then uh, I'll, I'll describe it graphically how it's working. It's very clever. Um, so what do we have? So we're starting with the distribution at time n. Uh, and we have this mapping, t of x. It's going to push it forward to time n plus 1. So we want this probability density function over the range variable, y. And to get it, we integrate along the domain variable of the function t. And as we're doing that, we uh, multiply the initial density. These are the masses that we're moving, the amplitudes we're mapping forward, against this thing called the delta function. So let me explain what this does. So the delta function here, here we've got y minus t of x. The delta function is actually transforming. We're, we're sort of moving along x. We're integrating. Then we're mapping that forward to the, the y value that t takes it to. And then this delta function sort of samples this distribution where y is equal to t of x. So generally, the way this delta function works, and one should do this carefully, but here's the intuition. The delta function, you can think about it. it it's as if it's, it's a distribution function. It's going to sample. It's going to be peaked. Delta of x is infinite where its argument is 0. And it's zero everywhere else. It's really just a mathematical trick. So I'm, I'm formally defining what this thing is. Um, it's, it's actually normalized. It's defined to be normalized. So if I integrate over the whole uh, domain, x, delta x, I get 1 out. So it's a little bit odd. I got this thing that just exactly one point where its argument goes to zero, it spikes. But we're going to use it to sample our distribution here. And the, the, and the key property is that when I integrate a delta function against a function, some arbitrary function, f of x, it returns, when I integrate it, it returns the value of f of x at the value where the delta function argument went to zero. So here we have this delta function is going to be uh, infinite when x is equal to c. and sort of samples f right there. So I get the value of f of c back out again. So you can think about these, these are kind of formal definitions of what this, this delta function is doing. So we're just integrating, this could be you know, any function here, and it just samples at one value, x equals to c. 
I could put a couple other delta functions in here. You know, X minus you know, D, X minus A, and I, then I get a, a, a sample of F of C, F of A, and so on. Okay, so now what's going on? So remember, the goal here is to come up with an operator that pushes a distribution forward. So what we're doing is we're integrating along. What it says, okay, we're going to integrate along X, the domain of the function. And at each point where I'm at an X, where Y is equal to T of X, I grab this probably amplitude mover over here. Notice that when T is very steep, if I move at unit speed here, in a sense, Y is going to be moving faster. So I'm going to take these sample probability amplitudes and spread them out, just like we did before with the normal rate slope. Or if it was slope is going to zero, if I move a lot here, why is it going to move? So the probability masses here are getting piled up, just like we wanted before. And in addition, we automatically take care of there being values in the, in the range of t where I get multiple contributions. So this is very clever, maybe a little bit kind of like a gimmick, but it's nice. And we can use this to calculate various things. Uh, we may be able to generalize it, but no, this has to be a function. Yeah, so. It doesn't, in fact, it can, it can be discontinuous, it can be all sorts of things. But this is general uh, Okay, so just to sort of exercise this a little bit to show how it works, uh, let's think about a one dimensional map. So x of n plus 1 is some function of xn. Uh, we have uh, values on the Real line, and then what we're going to do here, and this might sound a little silly, but it's a good basic case to get started with. My initial distribution is going to be the system is at x zero, and I represent that distribution as a delta function. Boom, just at one point, which is what we've been doing, or assuming. So it's just sort of more, you know, sort of complicated. It needs to be because we already understood that we're at x zero. We're going to go to x one, x two. We just apply. Uh, uh, f to that, or t, f in this case. Uh, but let's, let's, let's try iterating it forward using this, this, this operator. This particular Perl equation. Okay, so the rule was the distribution after one step over the range variable y is the integral of the initial distribution times the delta of y minus f of x. I'll just plug in for t here. Well, what's our initial distribution? Well, we, it's just a spike at this one point. Okay, and so what we can remember how delta functions work. This delta function is going to sample the other function where its argument goes to zero. That's where x, the variable, the, the domain variable we're integrating on, where x is equal to x zero. So I just substitute that in. That's the only value that's going to be contributing. Well, what's that? That's a delta function at <coughs> y minus f of x zero. Well, what's f of x zero? Well, it's x one by definition. What's this? That's a distribution all concentrated at the next iterate, x1. Okay, so we just, you know, kind of through, through contortions, prove the obvious. <laughs> Namely, that if we start with all of our probability on a single point, it gets pushed forward and follows along a trajectory. Okay. Well, it's a consistency check for this operator, but, but, but at least in the special case, it reduces the but you can see how your, you know, how, how this works. It kind of samples, even if the other thing's a delta function, this rule still applies. So. Well, okay, so that's that's slightly idealized. So uh, expected. Now let's ask the, the dot spreading question. Let's let's imagine the, the initial distribution has some finite support, but small. So what we're gonna, gonna do here is go through a series of one-dimensional maps that are sort of increasingly more complicated and show you what happens when I when they iterate or push forward this initial distribution. So this initial distribution, this, I'm giving you the density again, it's going to be a uniform <coughs> uh, amplitude 20 centered around x is equal to a third and have a width of 0.025, so pretty small, but a little flat distribution there. 
Okay, so here's the first example, which actually is familiar to us because we talked about this when we did map labs. It's called the linear circle map. So here, here it is drawn out. We have the identity here. And there's just an offset, in this particular case, just point 0.1. So x0, I just add point 0.1 to it, add point 0.1, add point 0.1, add point 0.1, until it gets up to here. Then I mod 1 and wraps back around again. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is start with, so here's that initial distribution, p0, centered about a third, plus or minus 0.025, done quantitatively. Uh, the vertical coordinate, uh, it's often helpful when you're plotting probability distributions to use log, minus log of the probability, to see the features. Otherwise, things get a bit compressed. OK, so here we are. This is our initial distribution at time 0. And then we iterate once. So all it really does is just move over here. There's no change in probability amplitude. So all that's really going on is we're all the probability amplitudes across this, this little interval are just getting pushed over. We're really just changing the location of the distribution support. Okay, not really manipulating because the map has slope one. It's not spreading out, shrinking, or growing the probably amplitudes. Okay, so all we get is this thing just kind of mapping around, moving by a tenth each time until it gets up close to one, and then it maps around again and keeps going. So we just have this distribution just kind of just rotating around on the interval like that. So not so interesting, but it's a good comparison because. We can go to the shift map. So remember, shift map is 2 times xn mod 1. So it has these two pieces of slope 2. Everywhere has slope 2. OK, so same initial distribution. Now when I map forward, what happens? Well, certainly the points that are in the support of the distribu distribution move, right? they're hopping around the interval, just like iterates would. But now notice that two things happen. The probability amplitude has gone down. In fact, the plots are quantitative. It's actually gone down by a factor of two. And the width of the support is now twice as big. And that's all, of course, all due to the slope being two. If the support now is broadened, then I have the same probability mass that's got to come over here. Therefore, the probability amplitude has tapped. That's what it was. And on a log scale, that's just one unit down, log base two. Same thing again. So do it again. Probably amplitudes go down, and the support broadens. And then, of course, the whole thing's changed position because the iterates in the support are moving around. Again, uh, down by a factor of two, broader by a factor of two. Same thing again here, time five. So part of what we see here is that because of the slope, the spreading, this peak distribution is now kind of spreading out. Now, something interesting happens from the six iterate. Anyone know, have a guess what's going on here? So that goes back on that. Yeah. So again, the way we have to think about how the iteration is working is we're, at each step, we're thinking about the range and who can contribute. Notice here at time five, iterate five, this distribution now actually sits across a half. It sits across a half. So that means there'll be some values of x where I get two contributions. So this little, all of a sudden this bump appears out of nowhere. No, no, it, it, it's an overlap. There are two contributions. One piece, one piece from here, one piece from here. And go for this. And then from this point going forward, well, this, this is actually away from a half. It just broadens out, broadens out. Okay, so, so the net effect is that the distribution just spreads out. And you can imagine if I did this more and more and more, it would just go to this homogeneous, flat, constant background, which is a little bit of a hint that maybe there's a notion of an attracting distribution at long times. It's plausible I could start, could have started this initial peak distribution at different places and it would still end up down here. So in the space of distributions, we have ask, are there sort of attracting distributions? OK, let's keep going. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than the shift map. We'll do the tent map. Now, the tent map has slope 2 everywhere, and in particular when I'm taking 
Um, it has a control parameter A, but I'll set that to 2 so the map goes all the way to the top. And the only difference with the shift map is this upper, upper piece has negative slope. But as you remember from the first way we described how we push distribution forward, it doesn't really matter what the sign of the slope is. It's just the stretching factor. The absolute value of the slope is what's important for how the probability amplitudes change with time. So this actually looks fairly similar. There's, there's some differences in detail. Okay. Support moves, amplitudes come down, amplitudes come down exactly the same way before, because it just doesn't matter. Uh, the distribution here is sitting right under just one of the one of the monotone pieces, one of the other monotone pieces. Same thing, same thing, time five, and then boom, time six, something strange happens. So we do have another bump showing up, and that means that there's some part of this, well, it does actually have, the support does span both sides of a half, and then that means there'll be pieces that contribute, two pieces that will contribute to the, to the range. Um, and then there's also, uh, basically, a region where there's no probability. That's where that upper value maps. This piece up here, maps over here, and then there's no probability. Uh, and that keeps iterating on. So then we have another bump down here, it means we have two contributions, and so on. And the same comment about uh, doing this again and again. It would eventually go to a uniform distribution. Makes sense from a slope being really one field. Yes, everywhere, right. Right, right, exactly. Yes, I'll show you some examples of that. That's where the fun is. But, but this is the kind of ideal case. It just And very quickly, because it's always everything, the probability amplitudes are always going down by half each time. Modulo is occasionally kind of piling up and having multiple contributions. But that, those attenuate, and it just gets smaller and smaller. And so you can ask about, well, is there something we can say about the long time distribution? Imagine I had started, so if the long time distribution seemed intuitive that it would just be completely uniform. Imagine I had started with that. Does that distribution come back to itself? Is, it, is there a notion of fixed distribution, just like a fixed point? So we'll come back to that in the second part. But let's keep going on. So now the uh, logistic map. Again, I'm taking R equal 4, so the map, like the others, always goes to the top of the interval. Uh, we can calculate the slope here, and we notice that the slope, um, you know, it depends on where, where we are on the interval. So, we're, so the slope is greater than 1 when x is less than 3 eighths or greater than 5 eighths over here and over here. So we'll have spreading. But then between those two values, the slope is actually less than 1. So we'll have some concentration of the probability. So this is just a more complicated case, more interesting case. Right? Depending upon where we start in the interval, we might have lots of spreading or some shrinking. So here's the consequence. So same initial distribution. Mm, doesn't look too different. Just maps over here. You can see there's a little bit of a slope up here. And that corresponds to the support here. A little piece of support moving across regions of the map that have slightly different slope. So it slightly, slightly modifies the positive amplitudes back and forth. So just a little bit. But curiously, the way I chose this example, after the second iteration, it comes back to exactly flat. Um, and then, uh, oddly also for this case, the lower boundary, the support, is actually right at a half. Okay, so, so, so now this, at time two, this distribution is right under here, and we get to see. So what happens is that the, the, the lower part is a half, it's going to map to one. And then we also have the slope at a half being zero or very, very close to zero. So what happens is, it's a little hard to see here, so we have this piece this side mapping to one, and right there we see that there's a spike. Let me point it out here. There's actually a spike right here. So it was broad. Now it actually the support is now narrower. Right? I have a big piece here, but the slope's going to zero. That's getting concentrated, concentrated, in fact, concentrated so much. There's actually a, kind of a square root spike here. Um, and then one maps to zero. So this thing all maps down to here carrying along the spike now. And then, since the distribution is concentrated down here in a re regime where there's just a large slope, it's about four here, uh, it just spreads out, spreads out, and spreads out. So it spreads out, spreads out, and spreads out until we go from five to six, the distribution goes over a half, 
And then we see these kinks again because now there are multiple contributions. So this distribution goes all the way over here. That means that we values up here that get two contributions and we have a step. Also in this example, we're curious with that initial condition. This and the next iteration completely goes away. We end up with this you know, two spikes, one at zero and one at one, and the smooth distribution. And if you keep going on, that just sits there. So this converges very quickly, and so there might also for this case be this notion of an attracting invariant distribution at long times. Still, you know, well behaved. The difference with the previous maps is that we now have these the density function having these spikes be very large. Well, these are the easy cases. Or there are also some fun cases. So just pick r equal 3.7, just a little bit below, so the map doesn't go all the way to the top. Um, and here's what happens. So same thing we've already identified before. Support moves around. We see variation in the amplitude because as the distribution broadens, the amplitudes are seen parts of the map at different slope until finally the distribution maps spans a half, which that generates a spike. The spike kind of moves around. And now, now I just kind of jumped ahead because it actually takes a while for things to settle down, not like the previous case. It took exactly eight iterations. As we keep going, here's at time 20. We end up with this very complicated distribution with all these sort of remnant images of the initial spike. Every time the distribution spans a half, it generates another spike and carries all the spikes around from the previous times that the distribution got close. So we end up with, and this is sort of the generic case, a really complicated looking distribution with all these spikes in there. It's like density states. Oh yeah, it does kind of, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Just mapping, map, yeah, right. Density of states, right? Yeah. You're mapping a distribution forward. Exactly. It's, it's like a caustic or something. Yeah. Okay. So, before it was maybe uh, intuitive or plausible that we maybe talk about the distributions converging and becoming time invariant after many iterations. But those were simple functions. Right? Smooth, well-behaved, nice distributions here. Whatever these putative long-term distributions are, or, uh, they can be quite complicated functions. This isn't continuous anymore. As soon as we get a spike in there, we have these discontinuities, which again is why we sometimes have to work with the distribution function for these continuous time variables. Okay, so now, um, how are we going to think about these long time distributions? I just gave a bunch of examples. I kind of argued that it could be simple and complicated. There does seem to be this, in the space of distribution, some type of convergence. But how are we going to characterize this formally so we can work with it? So that brings in this notion of an invariant measure, or invariant probability density would be. Um, Invariant measure here is just alluding to um, something we're not going to cover, which is measure theory, which is actually the more formal version of probability theory that you need to use when you work with these really complicated, non-differentiable, sometimes not continuous probability densities. But I'll just use the phrase invariant measure. You should think invariant probability density. Okay. So what, what, what could this thing be? It's some kind of distribution of density that maps onto itself something like the analog of a variant set. So, and we'd also like to know, are these things stable? So um, it turns out as we try to investigate these invariant measures, stability is a, a slightly subtle issue. So I, and if I add a little bit of noise or change parameters, how much do these, these asymptotic distributions um, change? Are they robust or not? Okay, so what we're gonna do here is define uh, an invariant measure for just one-dimensional maps. Um, so 
an invariant probability density called P star of X is one that, first of all, the support is an invariant set. So at least the support has to be invariant in that itself, right? So that's some, some, some set here. So we have, we're guessing, okay, is this distribution P star invariant? Well, first we look at the support of it, right? All the X's that have positive probability, and then that set has to map into itself under the map. At least that. Now, more subtly, the probabilities are also invariant. They map into themselves. And we're going to use the chrome Frobenius operator to define it. Right before, we were using it to iterate forward, and it was a, in a sense, a dynamical system on distributions. Well, here's the analog of a fixed point for that operator. Right? We're looking for P stars such that when we plug it in, the chrome Frobenius, it pops back out again. So this at least is a formal specification. Gives you some constraints of how you might search for such P stars. Or show, or maybe if you guess one, then you could verify it using this. That it was one of these invariant measures. So this is a functional equation. This fixed point equation is a constraint on the function that we're looking for, P star. So here's a real simple case, sort of familiar. Um, let's imagine that we had some periodic verbing, periodic table verbing. So how do I describe that? Well, it's probably density. It's just going to be a series of spikes at each one of those values on the orbit, x1, fxk. I can write that down as a delta function of a product x minus x1 times x minus x2 and so on. So that, that'll, that delta function will then place these spikes right there at the x1 to xk. And the question is, is this an invariant distribution? So we just had this formal specification. So we're looking for p. We just guessed, and we want to calculate what happens at the next iterate, and then see if it's the same. So, so again, we just plug in here. This is what I've done. Um, but the same argument as before. We're following orbits. At least the math is the same. I have this function here that samples this function over here at x1 up to xk. So I end up with a delta function where I have the, the argument here is the product of those y's that are equal to f of the x1 up to xk. Well, what's, what's, what's f of xi? Well, that's value at the next uh, point along the orbit. So f of x1 would be f of x, would be x2, f of x2 would be x3, and then up to mod k. So I just actually do the iteration here. And I know since I define this periodic orbit, these map to each other under one iteration. And what is that? Oh, the result after I've kind of simplified this out and go to the mod here. Uh, X of uh, i plus 1, it doesn't really matter how I'm indexing, so I can just drop that. So I end up with this delta function of a product of y minus the x1, x2, x3, which is what we started with. So again, this is sort of a contorted way for proving the obvious, but at least it works. So in other words, we had these k spikes, and under one iteration, they kind of moved around each other, but came back to itself. So that's maybe a simple case, but at least how you can prove invariance. Here's a more uh, interesting case, but also pretty simple. Let's look at the shift map again. And I kind of argue when we were looking at the example of iterations that it looked like the map was taking that initial peak distribution to a flat one. So hypothesis, the uniform density on the interval is an invariant. So I'll kind of go through uh, kind of a graphical way of, of talking about that. So um, it's very handy. So I'm going to start off with my p0 being uniform here. It's, it's handy to break this calculation of the next distribution into two pieces, namely where the, uh, that part of the distribution that's under each of the monotone pieces. I'll do that separately. So that's this piece and this piece. Otherwise, I start with uniform, should have colored it yellow. I break this into two pieces. Then I, <coughs> I iterate forward this half distribution, one step, the lower half, and then the upper half, one step. Well, I, I just have you know, uniform density here, 
to here, and then there's just, I just multiply it by, by two, so the support goes zero to a half, and the range goes zero to one now, and it's spread everything out, and reduced the amplitudes by half. Starting with amplitude one is now amplitude a half in the range. So we go from this in the <coughs> half distribution to now this spreading out. This upper half, same thing happened here, goes over the whole interval, but probably the amplitude's half. And now I, every point in the range has contributions from each of those. So I add those two up, and lo and behold, I get the uniform distribution with probability one on the interval again, which is what we started with. You can do this with uh, um, the Frobenius Prone equation, two cases. It's essentially the same uh, thing. Um, break it into these two separate calculations. Just move half the distribution where the support is on zero to a half or above a half. And just plug in this distribution here. And now we're just integrating in the domain just from zero to a half or a half to one. Um, the calculation is very straightforward because P0 is uniform over the x we're integrating over. And then we know what f of x is. Well, that's just 2x. That's what the map does over that part, slope 2. Uh, and then that's very easy to, to integrate. We just get the value of a half out of that. And then same thing up here. Uh, all that's uh, different here are the basically how we're, how we're integrating because the map is still the same. So we get a half and a half. And then we add those two. For each y, we add those two contributions up. And we get the half and a half again, the uniform distribution again. Same sort of thing when we do the, the tent map. Um, the case where it goes all the way up to equal two. Uh, the only difference here is that we have a negative slope, negative two. But that doesn't really change anything. The, uh, the, the first calculation we did for the shift map, this lower piece is exactly the same. So we get this contribution of a half everywhere in the range from this part of the distribution, zero to a half in the domain. Um, and then the only thing that's different here is that uh, f of x well, up here is just 2 minus 2x. But you do the interval and it comes out to a half again. So the negative slope didn't make any difference here. Um, so two more, well, one more example and then one um, kind of an exercise. Uh, tent map. So just showing you how to calculate these things um, in some tractable cases. So you remember the tent map, the bifurcation diagram, it also had band mergings. Turns out, so for the tent map, instead of setting a equal to 2 like we just did, we'll set a equal to square root of 2. And that's exactly where the two bands merge. Um, and uh, we're going to guess a probability distribution here that has two pieces. Now, I'm, I'm doing this with full foreknowledge of some of the dynamics. Uh, it turns out that um, there are two pieces. And the boundary between the two pieces is exactly a, a non-trivial, unstable period one orbit, it's a fixed point. Uh, the upper bound here is actually the iterate of the maximum. There can be no iterates uh, that iterate above the maximum of a function. And then the lower boundary is the iterate of that. So what I'm going to do here is assume the distribution has these two pieces. The whole thing's normalized. And what I'm going to calculate are their probability amplitudes. So this is the, the, the guess here for the um, current distribution. Um, again, so the, the x max is just a over 2, or in this case, square root of 2 over 2. The minimum value down here, let's iterate this forward once. And then we know where this non-trivial um, fixed point is, the unstable one. And then we can just solve. We have, uh, what we want to find these two numbers, p0 and p1, the conservation of probability says that all of this stuff has to map into here, and all of this has to map into here of every iterate. Sometimes we call that noisy period two. Um, and then we, the other, other condition we have is normalization. 
the sum of those together is 1. And you can just solve that, these two equations, for p0 and p1. So we get the exact calculation of what those two p values should be. And then the interesting final case, which I won't go through the calculation, but it's part of one of the exercises, um, is the logistic map at r equal 4. I think I mentioned before, so folks back in uh, at the Manhattan Project in the mid 40s were using digital computers and they needed random number generators. So the uh, John Lennon mathematician came up with using this logistic map as a random number generator. And he also back then noted this is a very short abstract in the uh, AMS proceedings that this distribution was invariant. We saw that before was when r was equal to 4, and we iterated down to that just those eight iterations. We saw those peaks, so we have this kind of square root. So when x goes to 1 or x is 0, we have this kind of square root type divergence in the distribution, so you can see that here explicitly. Um, um, if you like doing integrals, it's good to show that this is normalized. It's kind of simple when pi shows up for all the reasons, for bizarre reasons. Um, and then you can also plug this guy into that Frobenius prone operator and show that it's invariant. Now the way you do it is through a coordinate change back to the shift map, and then you do the trivial integral. Well, this is how we do most integrals anyway. We try to make, them sim make, make the integrand as simple as possible. So it turns out there's a conjugacy. This is what the homework exercise is, a conjugacy. It kind of steps you through going from the, the logistic map of r equal 4 back to the shift map such that you can show that orbits of the shift map under this coordinate transformation become orbits of the logistic map. So in other words, you don't really do end up doing a hard, <laughs> a hard integral. You simplify the problem first. OK, so now some, some examples here. Maybe test our intuitions. Well, we just did this case. OK, so two bands merged to one. That was a square root of two. And then what I'm going to show you is just start with some initial condition, iterate a whole bunch of times to make a histogram. So this is what you get, which is what we just calculated. So two step functions, the boundary between the two pieces is right at that unstable fixed point. Um, but now let's look at the chaotic primary value, so more complicated, 1.75, essentially arbitrary choice. So what happens there? Well, the height is larger. That's right, about 1.4. This is larger, so the tractor is actually bigger, but we see all these kind of stepping going on. At least we have some intuition about why we're getting this stepping here, um, corresponding to the distribution, making contributions from two different parts. Um, and sort of an arbitrary chaotic parameter value for, for the uh, tent map, we're going to have, in fact, an infinite number of steps. Not easy to describe and eliminate them in this case. Essentially undescribable. Okay, so logistic map. So two bands merge to one. So now this is sort of interesting here. So if you remember, we, we can calculate the parameter by R where we get the two bands merging to one. It's where the iterates of the maximum map right on to the unstable uh, fixed point. And what we see is, I don't know, depending upon how you when I describe it, it's a pretty well-behaved function. There are only three peaks in it. And in fact, it's sort of like the, the tent map when I described it. This piece up here, one, one iteration maps down here, and this piece, the next iteration maps to this. And it's a period two component, but then within the bands, lambda. And then 3.7, well, I just showed you that. Just, just to give the kind of visual contrast, Sort of typical parameter value, where it's chaotic, you get this very complicated set of spikes. So this is an, the analog to the tent map of having these many different steps. All these different spikes, which makes it hard to prove things in particular about this. Uh, but the say real test will be this, the cusp map. So you remember the Lorenz max, Z max return map. And that our model of that was, was this. Summer. Had two monotonic pieces to it with 
then the slope went to infinity and a half. And here's a, a functional approximation of that, which I then found. Um, so now the question is, what's this invariant density going to look like? So the way I draw on this, the slope is always greater than one. Close to one down here. This is where the comes up. So slope greater than one means that there'll be a lot of spreading. So we should at least see, if we started even with peak distribution, some you know, moderately quick sort of attraction down to this long-term distribution, spreading everywhere. Small little concentrations are always going to get spread out and spread out and spread out. The distribution is going to spread out and spread out and spread out every step. What's going to happen here due to this? The slope is getting larger and larger and larger. It diverges here. That's a lot of spread. Any small little concentration of probability mass is going to get spread way, way out. So anyone want to place any bets as to what the distribution looks like? Of course, you could have looked at the PDFs I put online last night. But <laughs> it's extremely well-behaved distribution. It's very smooth. So that's the first puzzle. And not really, because like I said before, everything is spread. Right? The complicated distributions we just saw the spikes, or the steps in the tent map, the spikes in the logistic map, those were all due to the slope going to zero and taking probability mass and concentrating it, giving us well, square root singularities. Slope is always greater than one here. There's no concentration at all. And that leads to very well-behaved, smooth, continuous, differentiable probability densities, asymptotic densities. And it's a little bit, maybe, kind of at first, a little bit kind of puzzling. Um, now, is it clear that the probability that it's zero is higher than up here? We can sort of see that by looking at the map. Well, imagine I just plopped out here some iterate close to zero. Because the slope is close to one, I just kind of, kind of stayed there. Very slowly, very slowly. I spend a lot of time there. In other words, the probability will be larger. Whereas up here, like a one, things are spreading. So that's going to drop the probability density. So this is just a very, very well made smooth function. In fact, it keeps, keeps going back to zero. So that's a good. I mean, we have now a way of thinking about how distributions converge um, at long times, a way of formally specifying what it means to be, be being an invariant measure, invariant distribution, prone for fixed point, fixed point functions of a prone for being operator. Um, but it turns out there are a couple other technical issues if we want to um, uh, work with invariant measures. I mean, one of the main reasons we're interested in invariant measures is if you want to calculate some statistic of a logistic map, tent map, or more complicated maps, if you have the invariant distribution, then you just do an integral. I, I want to know what the mean value is or the deviation value. If I give you the invariant density, you can calculate that. So it's very handy. Um, Characterize many important properties of a chaotic system. Um, but as we talked about before, even the shift map has periodic orbits. And in fact, a countable infinity of periodic orbits. They're all unstable. You know, and kind of the typical point you would pick on the interval and iterate, like 1 over pi as a starting point, that, that'll be aperiodic, but they're still. Is a countable infinity of these periodic orbits, and every one of those things is associated with 
an invariant density, just like I proved. Any periodic orbit, if I start the initial distribution of these spikes resting on the points on periodic orbit, they're going to map into themselves. So this picture that we had, hopeful picture that, oh, in the space of distributions, we have a kind of dynamic and these attractors. So I was just giving you all the kind of positive cases. In this space of distributions, there are also a countable infinity of other invariant measures sitting on the periodic orbits. So if I just give you a map, one of the questions is, what would you actually see? Periodic orbit, all these delta spikes sitting there, or do we see this other thing, namely the ones I've been showing you? So one of the ways that you can sort of select out the, sort of what's now called the natural measure in this, for any mapping like this, any dynamical system, there'll be an infinite number of invariant measures. And you'd like to know what's physically relevant. Or what you can do is add a little bit of noise. So in each iteration, you add just a little bit of noise, arbitrarily small, and that will destabilize if the system is sitting on one of these invariant measures on a periodic orbit. Any small little variation will knock it off, and then we'll start to see the so-called natural measures, the ones I was showing you, kind of, that fill out the full orbit. And that's kind of a notion of robustness to these. You can also show that if you start on the uh, invariant distributions and you add a little bit of noise and then let it go, it will come back to those. So they are attracting. And, and stable and robust in a sense. So that's it for today. Do um, you have any questions? So remember, we're going to shift again next time to start talking about sequences of measurements, orbits and trajectories, and how we use probability theory to describe distributions, not over the state space, but over sequences in the state space. Which is in some ways kind of upping the ante and making a higher dimensional problem, but then that'll lead us directly into uh, information theory as a way of grappling with some of the complicatedness. Okay, great. See you.